th- from a piece that was posted on March 1st, there's this. So many people seem desperate for World War III. So can we talk about that? How How is that happening? Why is that happening? I think it's happening because people are desperate for narrative. We're desperate for the moral clarity that believing that there is a good side, the white knights on one side and the evil Darth Vader people on the other. And uh, we're being driven by passion. We are being set up, I believe, by the discourse that's coming out from our mainstream media. And if you in any way dispute the the leadership of Washington, if you dispute uh, anything that is proposed, like the no fly zone, that sort of thing, you are immediately jumped on and accused of being uh, a Putin apologist. You're carrying water for Putin. I got to tell you, Megan, I remember back in 2002, after 9-11, as as our country was marching up to the Iraq war, I was living in New York at the time. I was working for National Review magazine. Uh, I had been on in New York on 9-11. I saw the South Tower fall in front of my eyes. I was so hyped up with moralistic fervor. I wanted some Muslim country to pay for what happened on 9-11. But if I had admitted that, admitted that to myself uh, that openly, I would have immediately seen that this is no cause to go to war. But I, so I didn't do that. What I did was open myself up to any propaganda that came from the U.S. government and other hawks that justified war. And uh, I even remember writing for National Review, well, we may not succeed in democratizing Iraq, but gosh, we sure need to try. I believed in the power of our own good intentions as Americans, and it led to a disaster. I'm frantically trying to avoid the same thing happening this time around. But so far, it seems like I'm losing. Believed in the power of our own good intentions. And I know you've written about how you would have thought that 20 years of less than stellar results in Iraq and Afghanistan would have caused people to at least pause before putting blind faith in our military industrial complex. And yet here we go again, because the the narrative, and it's starting to creep into both sides. You say you've lost Democrats and Republicans starting to unite now around the narrative that we're the leader of the free world. We have an obligation to step in, put total faith and no, no one doubts the abilities of our guys in uniform, you know, our, our guys who actually would be serving and executing uh, such a mission on the ground or from the skies. It's, it's the leaders. It's the, it's the, I don't know, are they NGOs who try to push wars on us over and over and sort of try to pull the levers behind the scenes? It's guys like Millie, you know, who are more worried about white rage than they are about actually winning. You know, there there isn't that much pause. There's like a small pocket of pause. But for the most part, we seem to be gearing back up. Do we not? Yeah, absolutely. And it is unnerving if you live through the post 9-11 atmosphere in this country. I remember David Frum, who at the time was a George W. Bush speechwriter, he wrote a cover story for National Review that came out just before the war started in 2003, denouncing Bob Novak, Pat Buchanan, and other uh, people on the right who criticized the war as, quote, unpatriotic conservatives. And it turns out Buchanan, Novak, all of them were right about the war. But who's now one of the cheerleaders for we must get involved now to stop Russia? David Fromm. A lot of the same people are still here saying it again. And so many of us seem to be willing to listen to them because we see on TV these atrocious images of Putin's troops bombing the Ukrainians. Nobody denies that this is horrible. But uh, what, as you said at the top of the show, the important question, the most important question is, is it in U.S. national interest to get involved with a nuclear or trying to fight a nuclear armed superpower? These questions seem almost treasonous to the ruling class. And by ruling class, I mean the Democrats and the Republicans. I mean, the uh, big business, the entire blob that that is dead set on managing this discourse. Mm -hmm. It's not just about, well, Did Putin invade invade a sovereign nation? Of course he did. We know that. And you are no Putin apologist at all in any way. I've read all your stuff. It's not about whether he's good or bad or what he did is good or bad. You're real clear on on those bad and bad. Um, But that doesn't answer the question about whether this is in our best interest to get more involved than we are right now. Can I spend a minute on from, uh, I'm sorry, not on from, but on David Brooks, because you you sure. pointed out his writings in, in a piece you wrote recently. Mm-hmm. This is how he's writing 
about this situation. This is, I think, I'm assuming this is right after we saw the unified uh, European response, you know, sending weapons and cutting off relations and so on. He writes, there's been a restored faith in the West, in liberalism, in our community of nations. There has been so much division of late within and between nations. But now I wake up in the morning, pick up my phone and I'm cheered that Sweden is providing military aid to Ukraine. And I'm awed by what the German people now support. The fact is that many democratic nations reacted to the atrocity with the same sense of resolve. He goes on, this week we saw that foreign affairs, like life, is a moral enterprise, and moral rightness is a source of social power and fighting morale. And you see it a bit differently. You you don't quite see it as just a moment to wave the flag and feel good about this international unity in disgust. Yeah, that's right. And David Brooks is a friend of mine. He's a good and decent man. But I think he's deeply wrong about this. I think that moralism, when it's completely divorced from realism, can be a source of great destruction. I saw a couple nights ago, Stephen Colbert went on his show and he said that, yeah, the price of gas is going to go way up because we've cut off Russian oil. But that's a price I'm willing to pay for a clean conscience. This man makes $16 million a year. It's not going to matter to him if the price of gas goes up. I live in Baton Rouge, Louisiana most of the time. It really matters to people in Baton Rouge and South Louisiana where we have to drive long distances to get to work, things like that. But these people who are part of the blob, part of the ruling class, uh, they don't care. They don't seem to care, or rather they're so blinded by their sense of moral righteousness that they're not thinking about the morality of doing this to their own people. This is what upsets me so much, Megan. The same class that did not see Donald Trump coming because they had lost touch with the American people. And look, I'm part of this class too. Don't get me wrong. I didn't see Trump coming, but he came and he didn't come out of nowhere. In a similar way, Vladimir Putin in Russia did not come out of nowhere. He came out of the chaotic and destructive 1990s after the Soviet Union fell apart. We sent all these American experts over there to help Russia get itself in order, become a free market democracy and all that. And it turned into total chaos. The Russian people love to have Putin come in, a strong man come in and set everything in order. Again, I think Putin's a bad man, but if we don't stop and think Think about how these things came to be in our world, we're going to keep plundering into one destructive war after another. And this is why I know you must have seen the things that Professor John Mearsheimer, the University of yeah. Chicago foreign yeah, he's policy really said. Right. He's getting pummeled because this man said, pointed out how the West has pushed and pushed and pushed Russia on Ukraine. And now Russia is pushing back and we're shocked this came from nowhere. I mean, it's just crazy. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.